Okay, folks, uh, I was told to get started here. Uh, today's uh, weekly Ask an Expert talk is me, Alex Spencer. I'm a curator up in the aeronautics division, and uh, today we'll be talking about, I'll be giving a, what I call a sampling of our aeronautical uh, insignia collection. Uh, just for ease of the talk and space sake, we'll just go over, right over here to the other side of this post. That way we're out of the way of the crowd and people passing through. So come on over. Whoop, there we go. I guess we're ready to go. All right. Uh, aeronautical uh, insignia collection. What do I mean by aeronautical uh, insignia? Uh, they are unit badges. They're rank insignia. Uh, they tell, essentially, they tell and identify a person of who you are and what you do. And it turns a standard jacket, sport coat into a uniform is the way I kind of like to look at these things. It's probably one of the largest collection, individual collections that we have here at the National Air and Space Museum. I just did some quick numbers here this morning. We have roughly 58,377 artifacts in the collection as of noon today. Uh, 362 of those artifacts are aircrafts, so that represents 0.62% of the entire collection. As you can see, we have these huge buildings around here to house those. However, we have 7,000 840 insignia in the aeronautical collection. We also have another, I think it's about two, roughly 2,800 in our space history collection. So on the aeronautical side, these objects represent 13% of the entire collection. So um, I'd need to point that out. So we, we, th that uh, your objects that you look around here are just not the aircraft and spacecraft. Um, the collection came to us, the bulk of the collection came to us um, in, the in the 1960s and 70s, um, and we have really three significant collections that I like to talk about uh, or show you, and I have examples of them here in the collection. Uh, but the Institute of Aeronautical Sciences, uh, which is the precursor of the uh, uh, aeronautical, uh, American Institute of Astro Astronautics and Aeronautics, thank you, uh, came to us in the 1970s. Uh, the the co uh, collection was housed up in New York City, and um, when they outgrew their spaces and couldn't afford to uh, keep their offices open up there any longer, they approached the Smithsonian. Uh, they had been collected by uh, their historical branch, and specifically Lester Gardner, who wanted to follow the example of the Royal Aeronautical Society that was over in London. And in Gardner's collection, he uh, gathered together over 852 pieces. Uh, another collection that we have uh, was done by an individual, uh, and I also will credit his wife because of what she probably had to put up with with the man, uh, but it's the Mack and Rebecca Johnson collection, and they had well over 935 objects in their collection that they donated to the Smithsonian. But the big winner is uh, uh, Miss Catherine Smart, uh, who donated well over 2,500 objects to the collection. And, what she, and she was kind of a camp follower is kind of the like I like to describe her, but her brother was in the air service uh, in between World War I and II, and she noticed all these objects that were on the uniforms that, of her brother's colleagues uh, flying around the country, and she would actually uh, follow her, her brother around to all, her, all of his dis, di, uh, distance postings down to Panama, over to the Philippines, the West Coast, East Coast, as he got different assignments, and she gathered together different bits and pieces of all these different uniforms of all the different places that she, had, uh, that she went to and uh, gathered together this huge collection of things. So now, with that kind of background in place, I want to kind of show you kind of just a, a, a small examples of what we have here and how we do that and from these collections from the people that I say or just mentioned. For example, the Catherine Smart collection most of it was put in, she put it together in binders. Now, I can't even, uh, it came to us this way back in the early 70s. Uh, I'd love to take it apart, but actually the way she put them together is kind of an artifact in and of itself. But what she did was, as I said, she went around the countryside, or actually the world, I should say, gathering together the unit insignias of all the different units and places that were at the bases where she was assigned to. And they come in different ways, bits and pieces, uh, these, you know, textile ones, but also what we call these hand-painted uh, jacket insignias that went on to the pilot's jackets themselves, 
and they were sewn on and, but hand-painted by the various units that were there. And each one of these represents a different unit that may have been located at these different bases around the countryside. And actually we have probably in the collection examples of every single unit that flew for the United States Army Air Corps from, 19, from about 1922 all the way up to the beginning of, of, of the Second World War. Uh, from this collection. So the, as I say, today is a sampling of these objects. Um, and th some of them are colorful uh, and uh, ha again show different representation of what that unit's activity is. And they incorporate some of these motifs into, into their collection. So as I kind of flip through here for you, uh, you can see some of, the, some of these different objects as well. Also, they they showed, we show different ranks. So as part of the IAS collection, they approached uh, the various air forces around the world. And so we have rank insignia. These are, these are actually the bottoms of sleeves cut off of, of Royal Air Force uniforms. So we have from the li lowly flight lieutenant and we all, all the way up to the Grand Marshal of the Royal Air Force. So we, would have, we have an entire documentation, physical documentation of these different various uh, insignia as well just all the way up through uh, the various rank levels. Now, the RAF kind of followed the, uh, the example of the Royal Navy using the rank insignia on the sleeve rather than on the shoulder or collars as we, we, we're kind of used to with the Army Air Forces. Also, as part of it, civilians also have their own insignia. These are, this is just a small sampling of one of the thousands of objects from the Catherine Smart Collection of various groups and organizations that civilians could belong to in the aviation world. Uh, uh, little, um, little glider pilot gr groups uh, in this section, they're very small, usually worn in the lapel. Uh, the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, group like, groups like this have their own, own uh, uh, file, uh, insignias to identify their that their members can identify themselves with. Also, we, as I said, numerous examples are of the, um, come from airlines, and as I say, we have well over 200 different airlines uh, represented in the collection. What I want to show you here are just two boards from from the from Pan American and its subsidiaries and their series of of, uh, of, pi of pilots and crew badge wings, and again, all of these are come from different sections and different subsidiaries of uh, of uh, Pan Am. They're early early badges that uh, just had the PAA on them, all the way up to their globe uh, west uh, Western Hemisphere globe insignia, to the last insignia that was worn by Pan American pilots and air crews all the way up through. But we also have examples of, of Cubana, which was one of their, uh, which has the map of Cuba, which was one of the areas which Pan American flew down to during the 20s and 40s, through the 50s, uh, and that was one of their airlines. And one of our rarest pieces actually is um, down here, uh, a, a piece from UMCA, which was their, uh, uh, an airline that didn't even exist. It was just a paper airline set up by uh, Pan American to make sure that no other competitors could get into that, that area of the Caribbean, of, of, of South America. So those, and that was worked through the governments down there. So th they didn't even have an airplane, but they actually had crew badges. So with that said, um, uh, we have these badges, and again, in many cases, these are the only, you know, these are the last existing pieces of some airlines. I'm not saying there's other, there's not other Pan American items, but we do have some, some other objects in the collection of airlines that no longer exist. Another important aspect that these insignias do for you is it, it identifies on what you do. Here, for example, are insignias of civilians again, but these were worn by war workers in Great Britain during World War II that were in the essential services that, that this way they could identify themselves as everybody was walking around them in uniform doing very important things, fighting the war, for example. Well, they could demonstrate the importance in their contribution to the war effort by wearing the badge that identifies them uh, as, a, as a, an essential war worker. And these are various companies that were building and manufacturing parts and pieces from 
uh, in the British manufacturing sector. Also, these were important as well, that they would identify the person as a worker going into the factory also. So you would be wear, wearing this badge, and that would identify you as, as kind of identification card, letting you go into the factory. Because, again, these are war production areas which were uh, you know, subject to sabotage. So they would be wanting to monitor who and who is not going into and out of the factories. So again, these, these kind of badges would also identify you with that. The other thing that I kind of find entertaining about the collection as well is that, they, that badges identify you as to what your job is. And I have a handful of objects here from just the Colombian Air Force. And these are all, pilot, or all wings and badges from, pilots, or from the Colombian Air Force's uniforms. So we have an installation officer. We have a navigator. We have a command pilot. We have another different kind of navigator. We have a pilot, uh, a, 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 a superior pilot. We have a general officer pilot. We have a 16-year flying experience pilot. We have a pilot with less than 16 years flying experience. We have a pilot with less than 12 years flying experience. And we a pilot with 3,000 hours of flying experience. And it goes on and on and on to, for example, flight surgeons, uh, medical officers, bombardiers, supply officers, uh, parachute trainers, and chaplains. So everybody has their own job. And, and again, I still have a half a dozen here to go, folks. And uh, so every, as I say, so you can identify what the person's doing as they walk by you. So it's kind of like a game of, instead of identifying the bird as over in natural history, you can go around here if you see somebody walking around in a uniform. And with their badges, you can identify what their job is. All everything that I'm talking about here today is available to you to see online. I have now taken this entire collection. You can go to the museum's website, and every single piece that we have here now has been scanned, digitized, and you can actually go through them through, through the museum's website, identified, I hope, properly. And if they are not identified properly, I welcome emails from everybody saying, this is not what you say it is. And I've, um, it's actually helped me in numerous cases because I I've, I've have put things up online saying unidentified and people out there have actually managed to send me send me notes and emails saying that's what this is and uh, has been uh, so the public out there is of a great is a great resource that you can never turn down for their help thank you for listening to this edition of ask an expert a companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available for a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.